All right. So today's today's lecture. I'm feeling a little bit under the weather lately, so my usual energy isn't here. Forgive me. Today's lecture is enhanced physical per perception. So that's uh, that's a kind of a weird topic, a great topic. Like it could almost mean anything. So I'm gonna have to narrow that down a little bit. So when I when I say enhanced physical per perception, enhanced physical perspection, perspection. <laughs> I keep trying to say perspective because that's what powers the damn thing. Um, <laughs> the enhanced physical percep perception is what you experience, but the, uh, the physical perspective is what gives the thing uh, its ability to work. So I, I kind of got tripped up over my own words, getting ahead of myself. So enhanced physical perception, that is the ability to understand more of the information that reaches you, which you currently block out without your conscious effort. So that's a very specific definition, a very specific definition for a reason. Um, this is not um, how to heal eardrums that you blew out with too many headphones. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> like this isn't a healing type thing. This is not a regeneration. This is this is more of noticing how much information you throw in the trash. How much information that reaches your senses that is instantly deemed irrelevant without decision. That's what I'm talking about, is how to start going through your mental trash when it comes to your physical sensations. And subjectively, uh, my volume is at 30%, just got it to 100. That's why you smiled. Oh, I, here I thought I said something clever. <laughs> it felt like a clever moment, too. So that was like, I was like, yeah. Everything you say is clever. I was oh, like, that's a lie. You're the worst kind of liar. <laughs> You're the liar who doesn't tell me what's wrong. <laughs> I am a fantastic liar. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't say you weren't good at it. <laughs> All right, um, so subjectively, then, that's why I can have the title for this lecture that I do, Enhanced Physical Perception, is what it will feel like subjectively. You will notice an increase in power uh, of awareness. You will notice an increase in the amount of information you can understand without feeling overwhelmed. And all of these things are happening already. So the exercise is not a physical one. I need to be clear on that. This is not a physical exercise. The exercise is experienced physically. But what directs the experience is the specific state of mind that is looking for specific things that you are capable of doing but don't normally make a habit of doing. It's knowing how to practice. It's knowing how to focus because there are certain things that return a bigger investment when it comes to the investment of focus. You can focus on a thing and get very little from it in terms of how much you could predict the world. Or you could focus on the same quantity of data but that quantity of data is so much better understood that the amount of understanding you gain from looking at it that way is larger relative to looking at something that is tangentially connected. Meaning there are sweet spots of perspective that have lots and lots of things tied to them if you know what to look for. So it's those points that I'm going to talk about when I talk about enhanced physical perspective enhanced physical perception. It's the ability to sense a lot um, or to have a lot more relevant information with the same amount of data that you've always been provided. So you won't need to do anything to increase your, your resources or your reach 
um, or you don't need to, to, to do anything to, to have all of the tools required to start this. That's my point. This is the poor man's, um, the every man's uh, toolbox, really. Um, you can supplement it with money. You can supplement it with talent. You can uh, supplement it with, with training or toys or other people who do these things for you and are close enough to you that you get that benefit. And that, that, that's my thing too. I'm, yeah, I'm the people one. Yep, yep. So it's it's uh it's the difference between being parasitic uh, or symbiotic, um, which by the way, every parasite will say it's being symbiotic. So feeling good about the way you do things is not enough to give yourself a pass if you've accepted this part of your way of thinking. Uh, you need to look deeper. Uh, and double check that shit out because, of course, you're. You, of course, it's fine when you do it. And vampires don't mind turning other people into creatures of the night for their own benefit as well. If you ask the vampire, uh, but personally, I don't know that I'd be willing to give up garlic. So when I talk about enhanced physical perception, what I am talking about is the transition from parasite to producer. And I want to take a moment to shake the mental and emotional baggage off some of the words that I just used because I didn't put it there. And those are the right words for this job. So I need to make sure those words have their true intended meaning and not whatever's been attached to them. When I say parasite, I mean the biological definition of a parasite, a thing that attaches itself to another thing and draws on something it makes for sustenance, a thing that it can't make on its own. The host pays the cost. The parasite lives. That's the definition that I'm using. If you've got any sort of moral attachments to that word in some sort of other setting, keep them. They don't belong here. Uh, and then the second word, producer, which is another word that's got a bunch of shit attached to it. Uh, if, if you've been reading too much Ayn Rand or if you've been reading too much Communist Manifesto, the word producer will have a, a, a weird taste in your mouth. Um, when I talk about producers, there's no moral attachment. It is the thing that makes things. If you make a sandwich, you are a producer of that sandwich. If you make a fart, you have produced that fart. The source of things, their generation, the thing which powers the creation process. That's what I mean by producer. So when I talk about enhanced physical perspective, enhanced physical perception, some of those things that you don't know how to feel that have been filtered out as irrelevant are production related parts of your body. So what that means is, um, here we go. I gotta mute these notifications here. This chat group is, is killing me. All right. <laughs> um, the things that are produced in your body, um, you may have closed off your awareness to things that you need, uh, which happens all the time. Uh, if you close off your awareness to duality, you're gonna be depressed. Uh, if you close off your awareness to relaxation, you're gonna be anxious. Uh, if you close off your awareness to compassion, you're going to be harsh yourself and others. So that is why this is a big deal is because everybody's set of current physical perspective and current physical awareness and what they do with the information they have is different. Um, but it's not alien. It's not like there's an infinite set here. Think of it like a, a game of Pokemon where there's lots and lots of different cards and you can have some of them and have a winning strategy uh, and you can be missing some and it really sets you back compared to the others in the competition because they are fundamentally somehow just the best thing for the best job a lot of the time and for whatever reason you don't have it because the part of your brain that accepts information has rendered every clue that is tied to the utility of this thing irrelevant and invisible. So that's why it's enhanced is because currently it's locked up. And who locks it up? You do. 
And how do you lock it up? By being stupid. And what do I mean by being stupid? You lock it up by being stupid when you think there are things that you can't unlock. You lock it up by being stupid when you say there's nothing there. But you can't describe why or how. You just know. Well, what you know is, is a small percentage of what there is to know because there's too much to know. So that's an easy comparison for me to make. Everything that is to know versus what you know, of course you lose every time because two of you would beat you like badly. <laughs> and even two of you don't have a very big percentage of everything there is to know. You have the exact same percentage. That doesn't really help anybody <laughs> unless one of you dies. <laughs> and I guess at least there's a backup copy. But my point is, that's how the limiters are there. And there are reasons why this happens. Um, your body is a finely tuned instrument for certain types of measurement, for certain types of observation. Your eyes, if you were born with, with regular functioning eyes, uh, even with prescription lenses, like even if your vision is bad, you have the ability to navigate through the reflection of photons in a three-dimensional world uh, with enough precision to not die. There's a lot of shit that can kill you in the world if you're just walking around. If you go too far in the wrong direction, you'll be too far from water. There's that. Like the, 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 the earth is literally hostile to your life in most of its places. It doesn't have the water. It doesn't have the shelter. It doesn't have the food. It's fine without you. <laughs> it doesn't need those things. But as a person, as a person, you need those things. And so the ability to navigate the world by seeing is pretty darn useful. And uh, let's talk about what it means to see. Because we have uh, different types of vision. Um, a lot of different types of vision. If you go to like different books, you have your nearsighted vision and your farsighted vision, which those are, that I'm kind of borrowing the language from the things that steal um, for when it's not working. Like you have your farsighted focus and your ability to focus narrowly. So your eye is a telescoping lens, which can create a very accurate focal length with very good clarity for, for, for quite a good distance uh, if it's functioning the way that it should. And even with, I said prescription lenses, uh, what you can do with that is, is very complicated. Uh, it's very expensive to reproduce a fraction of that with, uh, with an electronic camera. Now, you can make a camera that's very good at part of that. But what I'm talking about is the ability to go from the very small and focus within a few centimeters all the way out to being able to see for miles into the night sky. That type of range of focus is not cheap. And you just have it. So that's one type of vision. It's close up vision and far away vision. Um, color vision is another one. I'm familiar with that. I'm colorblind. So I have trouble with the red green. Uh, I don't see as many colors as normal people. I see the range. I see the beginning points and the end kind of the same. But what I'm missing is I can't separate out as many different shades of color as you do. Uh, if you have normal color vision, at least normal compared to everyone else who says they see the same thing. So there's that. And then you have um, night vision, right? Like your, your body has the ability to change how its lens is set up to operate in high light and low light conditions. Um, and if you've ever gone to the, the bathroom in the middle of the night or had the light turned on when you weren't ready, uh, when you were sleeping, well, you know exactly what that feels like because your, your eyes were calibrated to the wrong thing. Like what happened? Did the light suddenly get brighter? No, it's all you. Your, your equipment is malfunctioning uh, or rather your equipment hasn't been used properly. You need time to adjust. It's not designed to change on a dime like that. It's a finely tuned biological organism. Like there's, it's like a transformer, man. You, you, even Megatron takes a minute to get up, you know? Like you can't just go from light vision to dark vision. 
you got to go through the process. If you go too fast, you're going to have a bad time. Um, that's what cancer is, by the way. Your cells divide too fast. You have a bad time, um, more or less. So um, there's peripheral vision. So, hey, Hal, good for you to join us. We're talking about enhanced physical perspective today. So we're just going to, whoops, I didn't hate myself. There we go. All right, now good to see you. You can you can speak up if you want. I'm kind of talking about uh, enhanced perspective. I'm talking about vision right now, all the different kinds of vision. So mm -hmm. good to see you. All right. Oh, I had many visions. Yeah. Oh, very good. Um, so yeah, and then there's there's a. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna put you on mute because I'm getting a weird little hiss. Um, but yeah, if you've got anything to say, raise your hand and I'll give you the floor. Uh, but I'm gonna keep going. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, 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 I have to say my mobile data I still have no Wi-Fi. Okay. So, but I just want, I just wanted to say hello, and oh. I, I had ma many visions, many visions. Yeah. Okay. I mentioned mm. you a lot last night. We, um, oh. we, we breathed together, Tom, uh, before we started last night, and uh, Hulk's mm. uh, default breathing was the uh, breath of fire, and so we talked a little bit about that. How's that coming along for you? As expected, like I, I don't really see the same problematic areas you do with it. Like, um, I think you've been able to make it happen. Well, I think I could have made it happen three months ago. I think I'm planning for at the beginning of month six. Okay. You want to you want to you want to put up right at the deadline. I I can respect that. Take maximum oh, that's possible not, development. That's not right at the deadline. That's, hey, I was, that's I was still a whole month. I was saying you had a good strategy. Oh. <laughs> a strategic merit. I will go to bed and listen to the music Polar Prize uh, 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 celebration. Uh, I'm very tired, but I just wanted to say hi. I, really I love you. Try, if you haven't already, Hal, try a nice 432 hertz uh, video. Yeah. That's a very good, good uh, hertz. It hurts so good, 432. You should know what that means. <laughs> oh, he shared quite a few different um, videos with me for breathing and or meditation and tones and sounds and all that stuff. Yeah. So I think with my theory on the liver and the emotions and the vibrations and the music, I think that's confirmed by, oh, uh, oh. they're all very specific. What are you doing? Your lungs and your throat are right, are, are a main line right to your liver. And I just got goosebumps, so that means I'm right. Because when you get goosebumps, it's when you've transcended your current limitations. Spidey right. sense is tingling. When you're touching it anyways, if you know how to grab it, um, that's the goosebumps is the moment. That's the moment to really reach out and grab it. Something lives there. Like if you're a shadow boxer and you get goosebumps, you go looking for a fight. Those are the biggest bang for your buck. Anytime you get goosebumps, go looking for a fight. Uh, anyways, back to the, the topic. Um, oh, peripheral vision. So you can see straight ahead and you can see kind of off to the side and you lose, you know, sort of focus the further out you get. But you would be surprised at how many things you react to that you don't know that you saw because you did see them. You just weren't paying attention. And fair enough, who pays attention to their entire field of vision all the time? Well, I can tell you who. I can tell you one person who, someone who's bored and wants to see how much of their field of vision they can pay attention to at the same time. Um, but why did I do that? That's the question, why? I did that because I had ADHD and extreme anxiety. And I didn't realize that my extreme anxiety was causing my field of vision to be very narrow. 
I could only see a thing right in front of me. If I had two people standing next to each other, I couldn't look at both of them. I had to be looking at one or the other. If something was in the room that happened while two of those people were talking to each other, I had to look at that thing. And I couldn't see either of them. What was happening was because of the anxiety response. I was so focused. My camera got very small, which is what it does when you're looking for small details. Looking for small details is an anxiety response. What did I miss? What don't I know? Now, what is that a personal anxiety response or is that a physiological, of, physiological anxiety response? But by specific, I mean, of um, could the opposite also be true? And then when you relax, the question, you zoom out. Well, is it possible to be anxious and it widen your view? or unfocus your view to take in more so information. The, the proper way to widen your view with a narrower scope is to find a very specific and useful point of relevance. So the thing well, you are looking for is smaller, but it has the potential to widen your view. That's the way anxiety can expand your field of vision. So if either is possible, then which is more likely to be the default? Uh, by far, it is more common that anxiety will make you miss things. By far. What's the first thing they tell you to do at every sporting event? Calm down. <laughs> uh, anytime where stakes are high, all the, all the top performers talk about ways to maintain calm. Sniper shooting. You have to be calm. You have to control your heartbeats. Um, archery, same deal. Boxing, you better believe it. If you're tense in boxing, you go out like a light because your muscle looseness is what prevents you from getting your brain rattled. When you lock up like a popsicle stick, one punch travels all the way up your spine and rattles your brain. Um, when those got, yeah, so the calmness is the, uh, the horizon expander. Physically, I mean. Now that's not to say that there aren't ways to use these tools uh, to overcome their limitations. Well, you, 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 just said, you, you just said a key, which was use these tools. And I think a difference in um, the way we think about anxiety is controlled anxiety versus uncontrolled anxiety. Yes. Because um, I've been watching some boxing recently and Mike Tyson came in without a robe and without socks every fight because it made him feel more carnal. What a different word or, for, for for what you're talking about. Um, well, I I what me anxiety contains fear by default. Um, to get the benefit of anxiety without the fear, that would be focus. Well, I don't see fear as negative in that way. I don't I'm either. I'm just that saying way. that fear is the component of anxiety that that powers it. There is no negative connotation to fear. Not one. Uh, it's useful. Well, then why would you want to have the benefit? Why would you want to have anxiety without it? Because sometimes the fear creates a physiological response, which is incompatible with a different thing you're trying to do. So it creates, a, it's about manipulating your base state so that your inner wavelength is optimal for the task at hand. Certain situations have different emotions that should be in charge of them. So recognizing which emotion should be in charge and then enabling your body to produce that at peak efficiency without the other emotions garbling up the noise because you really aren't sure which one it should be. You just kind of throw everything at it, which is most people most of the time. But if you can spot a situation and say, you know what, a little bit of anger and a tiny bit of fear, but a lot of motivation would fix that. And then you could say, okay, no room for sadness. No room for sympathy, not here. No room for this. So you wash that away and you create your pure message using the three or four things or whatever you decide was the right tool for the job. And then once that is finished, you begin the process again because now a different set of tools might be required. So it's the ability to very quickly um, summon and let go of useful emotions and 
knowing the right tools for the job is 100% of the utility of this. Um, knowing how is a very small part. We talked about anxiety and excitement before, and we also mentioned, or this is being led to because of the anxiety versus controlled anxiety. And with the better scope of those terms, I'm good to keep moving. Okay, fair enough. All right, so, so when I talk about the, the focusing, the, the zoomed in perspective, why would anybody look at their peripheral vision that way? Um, well, why is up to you. I don't care why you do it or don't. It was useful to me, so I did. <laughs> That's my answer. Anything beyond that, it's a fuck you. Um, thanks for asking. So what can you do then? So say you've decided to expand your vision this way. I'll tell you how I did it and you to practice it your own way. Maybe you're gonna be smarter than I am and it won't take you six months. Um, but anyways, it's easy. Look at two things and try to see them as one thing. And that might sound like a strange concept, but it's, it's really, that's the focus of, that's the process of zooming out. So let's say that you have a dozen eggs. Well, now you're gonna jump already to the expert level because you can look at one egg but you understand what a carton of eggs is and can look at that as one object. Uh, and if someone asks, you could still say there's 12 eggs inside, but if you could only see one egg and a little bit of all the others, you couldn't necessarily say there was a full cart, not until you zoomed out and looked at the whole thing. Maybe it's missing one at the end. So now you have a carton of eggs as one thing. Well, now you have a carton of eggs and a glass of orange juice. That's two things, but you can look at that as one place setting. Hell, you could even add a plate with some bacon and some pancakes on it. And now that's a breakfast. It's one thing, but it's like 10 things. So what you allow yourself to combine as one thing is going to limit your growth of expanding how much visual data you can process at once. What do I mean by that? I mean, you can only focus on one thing at the same time. I'm cheating the system by defining one very loosely. So that's the mechanism, the exploit that allows you to get this input. Here's what shuts it down. You see things that you say are obviously different because then you have to compare them. And when you have to compare things, you're focusing on one or the other. That's how comparison works. And it's what your brain is designed to do. Everything you do is a comparison on some level. The words that you pick, the things that you pay attention to, the ideas that you like, it's all comparison on some level. And you make choices on some level based on the comparisons you make. So to expand your vision, to include your peripheral vision, you have to view everything that you see as one thing. And how do you do that? Practice. Same way you get to Carnegie Hall. Can't cheat the system on this one, unless you're just good at it. Um, you practice. I started in baby steps. At first it was a thing, and then it was a couple things, and then it was a person, and then it was two people. And I could watch what both of them were doing at the same time and tell you everything that they did because they were moving around and I was walking through my plant and they were working. And I could see they were both doing their jobs and I could say step by step. And then that was five people and then 10 people, and then 100 people in the room so that you can just look and have all of those people moving. And that visual data is just accepted. You don't need to focus on anything because that's not your goal. Your goal is to see what's happening. Your goal isn't to see what's happening right there. So if you can make it a little bigger, like if you can start small and make it work, you can make it bigger. If you lose progress, you try to get better too fast. Go back a step and make your practice some more. Practice the easier steps more. That's how I did it. It took me six months. I wonder how this relates to us seeing things differently. Remember, my core, part of my core, which you may know better than 90% of others, still less than five to 10, but 90% of others. 
is that uh, I'm against absolutes because absolutes usually define what things aren't. And I believe in being open-minded and trying to see more and always uh, zooming out in a sense. Are you always against yeah. absolutes? Absolutely. <laughs> That's the joke. But uh, <laughs> was that where you were going with it? Or I'm, I'm dead serious. You can laugh oh, at okay. it and say, yeah, but, uh, but no, does your test survive its own scrutiny? When I say absolutely, though, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, in humor, but uh, me being against them isn't to say that I am against all of them. It's to say that I'm against them in general, as in there are outliers to it, yeah. but it's a good general concept to when I see or hear, oh, kind of like better safe than sorry has the trigger of letting me know someone else's boundaries push. Mm -hmm. uh, hearing absolutes work the same way. It lets yeah. me know what you think isn't possible or shouldn't be and it always triggers me to try to find a way around that <laughs> like yeah how to, uh, the only advice i can have for stuff like well, this well, is, i was well, gonna remember, say you have to try yourself a different way yeah well i was you know, i said i uh remember i originally said i wonder how this whole con not whole concept but the last 10 minutes or so at least uh, yeah. since we started talking about different ways to see things because mm -hmm. even when you started going from the peripheral to the night shift to uh to um the other ways like that i, I was thinking yeah I, i've always done that <laughs> you know like um i remember watching a tv show brain games where yep. they uh did a lot of those visual things and uh and after the first one i saw the rest coming now yeah. i think that's that that's partially because of the way my dad raised me to watch tv and take in information because when we watch tv together we always figured out the end of, you know, whatever the show was before it came. And so yeah, and the more you do that, it, the better you get at it. Yeah. So now that I'm an adult, when I was watching brain games after the very first trick, it was like everything after that was like that. I know where they want me to look. I know where I'm supposed to look. What do I feel yeah. like doing? So uh, same thing with magicians, you know, slide of fan and misdirection. So, uh, so, yeah. so I'm just thinking with me being the zooming out type already, or that being my goal, already in mind, something that's to my core, I wonder how that relates to the way that um, that we have functioned within this information. Um, the only thing it's I something... can tell you from my experience that was meaningful, like the most meaningful change was learning how to zoom out didn't make me forget how to zoom in. Um, in fact, it's usually remember to zoom out because my default state is zoomed in. But where that helps me is knowing when to zoom out gives you the big goal and how quickly you can recognize you need to zoom out gets you the proper coordinates to where you can zoom back in. Most of the magic that happens in the world that people don't understand happens in the world of the very small. Um, you don't realize it, but the way that you say hello can stick with a person eight different ways. And some people are better in tune with that. And just by putting out a certain energy in a certain spot at a certain time, if you understand the path of that energy, how long it lives, what direction it goes, and what it's likely to do after it leaves you, you can start to send out things that will intersect with each other and do I things remember that, that are different than what you would have done. And they're all very small. I referenced sixth grade a lot, but um, also 2006, when I started college, I had the uh, opportunity to reinvent myself. Nobody there yeah. knew me. And so I did. And the kid in high school that I was, I was able to make him into the identity I wanted him to be and become that person. I, um, I always tell people, know who you are, but decide who that is or choose who that is. And, um, and uh and or like going with that perspective people oh i remember running those social experiments in college you said uh the way you can make hello hello makes people feel i remember 2006 and probably most of 2007 as well i'd go through different techniques and i would try to use the same technique Keep going tony i'm gonna mute myself for a second i gotta take this call um so i remember different techniques uh that i would take to dip, i would try to use the same technique with different people to see what result 
it will elicit. Now, of course, I'm always going for positive emotion, but uh, you talk about the smile a lot, or at least we used to talk about the smile a lot um, when you thought you would get to my smile or that you got my smile, the essence, the vibe. Well, that smile came from me starting as a cheerleader, but also um, it got to a point where I remember sitting at a table full of people. Well, it was probably a booth of six people at least. And, um, oh, no, it was a table because we used to go into the student center where there were a bunch of tables and we'd have to put a bunch of them together for my crew. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I said, I can make you blush. I can make people blush without ever saying anything and just by genuinely smiling at you. Mm -hmm. I, I was able to like, literally like a party magician's trick radiate and beam, you know, a certain reaction. And so if I can do that without talking, just adding one word to it or a phrase. I remember for some reason, a bunch of kids got into the uh, friends, uh, Joey's saying of uh, how you doing? And so like, I took that line like and just ran through campus with it. Yeah. So yeah, I remember yeah. running those social experiments. So that's, um. Um, I don't know if I did this lecture or not. Uh, this might be in a future lecture, but one of the things that is true about the way humans understand information, uh, we understand it many different ways. Um, but one of the ways that unites us is we all have the same physical brain and kind of liver structure and uh, hormone secretion system. So we don't necessarily know what's going on with any given person, but so long as that person is an average human, uh, their predicted range of responses is going to fall within what that body can physically produce. So uh, the bodies can't produce an unlimited type of responses, just a, a large variety of them. So what that means is because we don't have a choice in the system and because this system is universal to humans, that means there is a language that is understood, which crosses subjective observation on some level. So that's the, the truth. That's, that's the argument. Here's the test. The test is, can you communicate with somebody on those channels and be understood? And Tony, you've just given a perfect example of yes, absolutely. Um, and if I were to go taken, so but but be not mistaken, that's within this context. That's well, within this see. context of a safe college campus <laughs> where somebody who looks friendly, you are willing to accept positivity from. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, well, the way that I phrase it is um, because that body behaves that way, it's like a networking port. Uh, and if you want to get fancy, it's almost like a Wi-Fi network port information is shared and there are security protocols in effect do i know this person do i trust this person will you accept cookies from this person these are all good tests for a human being um, like you ask these questions before their information is evaluated but what i'm saying is if a person lacks sufficient self-awareness sufficient perspective self-awareness if a person lacks awareness of how their emotions are generated, that means their ports are open to the right type of key. Um, what that means is you understand how to be accepted chemically. You understand how to make the body decide you are a friend instead of a threat, just by pressing the right buttons in the right order. You have paid attention to that system sufficiently that you can recognize it comes in many calibrations and specific settings, but there are ways to reset the machine to a predictable default ground state that you know how to interact with reliably and win. That is um, the way that I view the type of communication that you said, and it gets as complex as a programming language. You can do more than say hello. You can do more than make them wave back at you which is the first trick that everybody learns. Hey, hey, what do your kids do? They just repeat the shit that you do. They don't know what's going on, but that's the first trick that you learn when you get the password. Everything else is what do you do with it? Which if you take these lectures in enough to break your brain the way mine is broken, 
then you can do a lot. <laughs> like uh, it's the fucking manual. This is the code book for program. This is how how to get shit done. And I didn't write it to use on other people. I wrote it to use on myself. Uh, and it's been very useful. Um, but anyways, to get back on topic, uh, yeah, perceiving energy, that's a type of gut reaction. Okay, why is it a gut reaction? I can tell you. Your liver makes all of your emotional decisions for you. That's just a physical fact. Your liver is what decides. So when shit doesn't add up, that's why it hurts. There was a step back that I was going to take with different perspectives. And it wasn't the senses. It was about how we have different perspectives and colors and how the well, universe has emerged. Scale from, my, from what I was understanding. Yeah, how it was the, scale. But, oh, that's it. Okay, so scale. And you mentioned zooming out to better zoom in somewhere else. Yep. Um, something that I've always been great at online is uh, being able to, you know, see, di- see two people's perspectives or see where my perspective is and where, oh yeah, that's right. I've told you before. I only ask a question. Usually if I see some way to bridge the knowledge between me and them in some way. Um, and that I think is the zooming back in. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that the was question, a, the question I know sometimes, focus. yeah, I know sometimes you appreciate a uh, retelling in from my viewpoint. Yeah. You can, so that, that wasn't a question of any kind. No, no, I, I got it. When you yeah, were where you're coming from. Okay, cool. So we can keep going then. We went uh, on to, uh, we were on. I was talking about vision. I was finishing up vision. Yeah, there we go. Um, so, so the whole, why would you learn to zoom in and zoom out? Well, I can tell you that it will make you more aware of your surroundings. And some people say, well, who cares? Why would I want to be more aware of my surroundings? Uh, the world's a terrible place anyway. Um, well, to you, sir, I say, stop it. Um, that ain't right. Uh, you ain't right. I don't know. Uh, why would you want to do that is because here's the thing. When your body doesn't pay attention to something, it puts something there. And the thing that it usually puts there is here there may be dragons. <laughs> So the less that you notice around you, the more physically you will experience the unknown uh, as your constant best friend. Now, that isn't to say that you can't develop ways to overcome this. That isn't to say that you can learn to survive without that certainty. That is to say that there is a physiological alignment that goes along with that specific way of thought, just like every other physical alignment goes with every other way of thought. So what that means is if you can't turn it off, then it's working against you all the time, except when it can't. And that is a very poor timeline to have something on your side. (laughs) It only doesn't hurt you when it can't. No, that's terrible. That's a bad standard. That's why things are relevant. Because when something's not relevant, it only can't hurt you when it can't. That's a very good argument against relevance. Uh, (laughs) Because you will have nothing to do with that interaction by choice. Um, So that's the reason is you don't have to pay attention to what's going on around you, to be aware of what's going on around you. That's the misconception. Oh, I won't be able to turn it off. No, what you're gonna learn how to do is turn it off for a second at a time, every few minutes or every few seconds so that you get an updated mental snapshot so that you know before anyone else in the room, something is going on. And when it comes to figuring things out, whoever figures them out the best, the fastest wins. If you're looking, you know, say get a promotion at your job or to, to, to score points with them, fly honeys over there. If you are the guy 
who has the answer and makes it look cool the first, you win. Everyone else is just playing second fiddle, they're runner up, fastest loser. <laughs> That's an exaggeration, of course, but uh, sometimes it's true. Everybody doesn't win. There, and I'll tell you something, there is a set amount of adoration in every room because adoration is not unlimited. So that means if one person has all of it, you will get none. Not because they don't like you, but because they ran out before they gave him what they felt he deserved. Tony, you look like you wanted to disagree with me. Well, I still do, but I gotta put it in a way that makes sense. That's good because my way used simple words. So if yours is complicated, and that helps me. <laughs> well, yeah. well, you said there's a set amount of adoration in a room. At any given time, I would say that's true. Just in terms of power alone. In terms of power as in dynamics or the ability to sway the group or to... Or to just be produced. A person has a maximum amount of adoration they can express. They have yeah, so I'm trying to think about, is it possible to have a team that elevates themselves and like- Oh yeah, that, that, that amount that can go really high and you can add it up and you can harmonize it, but it's but, still not infinite. I think maybe you're trying to, there is a practical infinity, meaning you would never need more than this. So for anything you could imagine, but it's not, not, not the same it's not thing. infinite because are you measuring it in the human in the uh, human attention span in a sense like we can't give energy or attention to more than one person at a time or group at a time so anything that we can see as one thing at a time so it could be a family or an individual uh, or an organization a sports team or a rock band anything where people get together and exchange energy like that, where they exchange having a good time through a shared experience. Yeah, those would all be examples of that. Like, and you top out as well with the amount that you can receive. What? That number might be amount. Like how much of that do the what? rock stars what? get on stage before they just What's the difference between 50,000 people cheering and 100,000 people cheering? At some point, okay, fine, maybe that's double. But what about 100 and 200,000? Does that sound like double? Eventually, they get too far away that you can't even hear them. Or like, what, at what point does it all just blend together? And you don't feel the individuality of it anymore. What do you um, mean by individuality? Like, Meaning that in much the same way that you can limit the scope of your perspective on vision, you can limit the scope of your perspective on adoration. But it's a very different method and mechanic than your eyes use. But the structure of that logical argument remains. Mapping it out would be the exploration of how to expand your personal awareness of that experience. So if that is currently a amorphous thing that doesn't exist, possibly hiding behind that is knowledge you could learn by exploring the limits of your ability to experience adoration finding out where the cutoff is, how to, how to play, because once you find the limit, then you can learn how to do more because now you know it's limited. Whereas before it was infinite from your perspective, but you found the edge and now you can build. That's what enhanced perspective is, is assuming you can do more with what you have than you can do right now. Um, I spent a lot of time on sight. I want to talk about uh, hearing as well. So here's the, the core premise behind expanding your perspective on hearing. Noises don't happen one at a time. <laughs> that is the first thing that you gotta that you gotta you gotta dive into, man. Head, head first, hook, line, and sinker. Noises do not happen one at a time, they happen in layers. So stop organizing time or stop organizing sound by loudness. 
That's the other thing. The loudest noise in the room is not the most important noise in the room. The loudest noise in the room is the most distracting noise in the room. The loudest noise in the room commands the most attention, but it doesn't necessarily deserve that attention or need it to do its job. So when I talk about um, how sound is organized, sound is organized in two ways, uh, technically three, three ways if you want it to be functional over time. Um, the first way is frequency, right? The tone it makes, the sound, the actual frequency, the resonance. That can be speech, that can be music, uh, it can be crickets, it can be your air conditioner humming, it can be your computer fan going. All of that is frequency, all right? Specific tone, specific volume, specific power. That's the first way sound behaves. The second way that sound behaves is over distance squared. So what that means is if you and I are talking and we're next to each other and we have one unit of sound volume, if we go twice as far apart as we were, our one unit of sound volume does not become half like you would expect mathematically. It becomes one over four, it becomes a fourth. So that means that the further you go, the quicker the sound drops off. Uh, the inverse square law. Yep, that's the, the, the fancy term for it. Tony shared that with the chat. The inverse square law. Yes, the further away you get, the less likely you are to hear the thing. And after like five doublings, it's practically zero uh, because the inverse square law behaves like um, the half life on a nuclear decay. Same thing. After five iterations, it's practically gone. It's still there somewhere. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's all friction and absorption. So anyways, frequency and distance. So when you are listening for sounds, well, the third dimension that I talked about is time. You're listening for sounds over time. So sound is really picking up a vibration. And if that vibration is doing anything, how that vibration changes. When somebody's talking, that's you paying attention to their words. Whoa, their vibrations are doing this in a very specific way. And these words, when vibrated next to each other, mean this idea is transferred from my consciousness to your own. That's incredible. <laughs> do you know how you do that? I don't. <laughs> Could you write it down? I, I no. Okay. Like where's where's the conversion, right? But that's what happens. The same way that you understand light, you understand sound. So that's how it's processed. It's, it's a vibration at a specific frequency that hits a detector that's designed to measure it. Your eyes measure the vibrations of light. Your ears measure the vibration in sound. Um, your, your taste buds, that's more of a, that's more of a chemistry set. Okay, you've already got two frequency vibration devices. You don't need more. Your skin is a frequency vibration sensor, by the way. That's what your skin does. Um, it's your sense of touch. Your vibration can be zero if you're up against something solid. You can feel a blow in the air. You can feel a sound wave go through you. You can feel something getting dropping. You can feel an earthquake. All of those are vibrations, changes in physical stability. That's your sense of touch. Um, your nose and your mouth is your chemistry set. You know how things react by their smell and taste a little bit. I'm not going to eat that. Why? Because it smells awful. Why else? Because it makes me want to throw up. Okay, I'm not going to eat that. Could you do that if you were blind? Absolutely. What if you couldn't hear? What if you couldn't feel? You can still taste that that thing is awful. And you want no part of it. So when I talk about the hearing, the way to think about sound is not volume. If you want to expand the amount of sounds that you can hear, the first thing you need to do is take an inventory of how much sound is in the room. Cycle through. Find one thing. And then once you've found it, label it irrelevant. What else? 
Is that a cricket? Is that, is, is that, is that my chair squeaking? There's people talking outside. I can say that, um, and this is as old as people have been breathing for fun um, uh, in a controlled setting to expand the way that they do things. Uh, being calm helps. Why? Why does being calm help you hear better? It's a physical reason for it. So your anxiety, remember from earlier lectures, is not zero or one. All right, your body's not that simple. And your body doesn't function that way. Zero and one is a terrible system to maintain chemical regularity. You have some or more or a lot. That's what your body understands. Some, more, a lot. Or if you're in trouble, hardly any at all. Unless you're just missing it, then you're in trouble because you don't have the tools. Um, sorry, not everybody gets all the tools. I don't know how to fix that, I wish I did. But everyone who's got the same tools, that's how they work. So when it comes to anxiety, anxiety raises blood pressure. It increases your ability to focus, which makes it more likely for you to be able to fixate on the most important thing in the room. It increases um, alertness. So all of these things are attached to a fixation process, meaning that process of focus is incompatible with focusing on more things like they're one thing, okay? So if you are prime set, ready to focus, if you don't learn what to focus on, you're gonna focus on the easiest things. So learning how to direct that focus is where the magic happens. So what I'm saying is when you hear sounds to get the fastest uh, expansion of your physical perspective, physical uh, perception, physically calm down and stop caring about any sound that you can hear. Only care about the sounds you can't, but keep track of the ones you can hear because that's how you know it's one of the ones that you can't. Oh, it's not that thing that I'm hearing. No, nope, I need to be aware that's going on so I always know that that's not the right thing. Um, that's kind of what I uh, uh, see that is this ability to listen. And there's, again, it's just practice. Let's practice at that point. Can you do that with songs? That's a great way to practice. Can you listen to the guitar for as long as you want? And then really the rest of the music goes away. But what about the drums next time? You only want to hear the drums. What about the bass? I only want to do that. That's great. If you, can, if you can't do that yet, that is where you start. Ear training sucks so hard. I already, I already told you about all that though, right? Like just because you hated that. Listen. Yeah, but I said I got the foundation, and since I'm a musician now, like that's what I do. Yep. So that's the thing is, if it doesn't make sense, you're trying too much at the start. Everyone can learn it, but you got to start small. The biggest changes happen on small scales. That's uh, they have to, because everything can be broken down to a small scale, and the smallest scale would see the biggest change relative to its own perspective. So that's a truism just because of how language organizes itself. I'm not really wise for saying that. I just noticed it. <laughs> Pointing it out. <laughs> you take that to party and impress your friends. Um, but when it comes to hearing more, if you can't hear one sound amidst uh, a collection of sounds, that's a good place to start because you're learning to isolate the one. And once you can learn to isolate the one, you can change what the one is. And eventually when you can change what the one is enough times, that's when you can notice two things that are happening at the same time, because you've noticed both of them before and you're not focused on what's happening. You just remember, you're remembering a thing clear enough in the moment that you don't need to pay attention to it. That's a very good way to say that. You understand a thing well enough to reproduce an ax. Uh, 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 you, you know a thing well enough to reproduce an accurate memory of it 
that updates properly in real time because you're focused on it just enough that you use your memory section of your brain to expand what you can pay attention to in real time. Because guess what? Parts of your brain are the only parts, the gray matter, right? The stuff in between. That's the only part of our memory we can access instantaneously. That's how you remember so fast. So what this is doing is it is using that circuitry and giving you enhanced physical perspective of what's going on there. Because guess what? That is how your subconscious mind learns. You are seeing the memories in real time using the memory circuits instead of the ones that focus your train of thought. So if you want to get really fancy with your mental reprogramming, that is how you create a dual core. That is different from a parallel processor. Um, if I'm getting my computer terminology correct, and I think I am, but if I'm not, here's what it does. Two independent trains of thought that can focus independently on relevant things without being distracted by each other, but they can also coordinate towards a shared goal. That is what's possible by developing this. And as someone who feels like a dummy a lot of times trying to get up to speed on stuff like I do, having that to be an option is very useful when you're trying to overcome other limitations that maybe other people don't have. Um, so that's, it's not like, hey, Tom's just rewriting the book on this stuff. It's, no, Tom is, is trying to live. <laughs> Tom is trying to survive in a world he doesn't understand. Um, surrounded by mean people and scary situations sometimes. Um, uncertainty and, and, and expectations and all of these things and angry people who don't make sense. Uh, all of these things were, were my reality. I needed things to get out of that. And this just happened to be one of those things. Use the skill set you've got. That's where your best powers are going to come from. My power is imagining how a thing could be possible. Enough to make it work, but not enough to make it work well, because I'm still bound by the laws of causality. So I get all of the fun tricks that I can do the way a kindergartner could do them. And let me tell you, the right kindergartner with the right tricks, who knows when to use them, can be the most competent adult in the room unquestionably but it's not guaranteed there's a lot of rules to make that work i'm going by this class probably about 90 hours so far <laughs> so can you do it yes can michael jordan dunk from the free throw line yes do you know how to dunk from the free throw line yes could you do it yet yeah maybe I don't know. I don't know you. I hope you can. That would be incredible. Invite me over. I want to see it. Um, but that's the thing is that's what I'm good at. I'm good at being the smartest kid in the room. The simplest solution, the thing nobody else would, thought, would have thought of that has its limitations. That's what I can do. And when you can do that over time, you can build really cool things. Um, so that's kind of what I've got about enhanced uh, perspective of memory. So what about an enhanced perspective of, of visual thinking? What's your language of thought? Is it nothing? Is it pictures? Is it words? Is it a voice? A combination? For me, it was nothing. It was the sound of my own voice. That was all I had. Um, no, no visual thinking, no spatial awareness, no hand-eye coordination, no 3D concepts. The enhanced uh, visual perspective was how I started building those things. When you don't have 3D spatial awareness, your hand-eye coordination sucks. It's the same thing as being blind in one eye. 
functionally, it's the same thing as being blind in one eye. You don't have depth perspective if your field of vision cannot change. It's another way of saying it. I had no depth perception, even though I had two eyes. Uh, I, I could experience depth perception, but I didn't understand it because of the way I used my eyes and the way that I always thought I had to use my eyes. I didn't know there was different ways of doing it. So the same thing is true when it comes to these other types of limitations. It's the first thing you have to do. Uh, Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. All right, Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade is the metaphor I'm pulling from. He's got the book. He's going through the tunnel to go get the Holy Grail. He's reading the book. He's reading the book. Humble man kneels before God. When he goes, wait a minute. Humble man kneels before God. And then he realizes he needs to drop to his knees. Uh, and the moment he does, the blade comes over his head. And it would have chopped it off. Well, that's kind of how this works. Uh, except you don't get to be Harrison Ford. Uh, and the stakes are much lower, uh, at least as far as everyone else is concerned. And the stakes are much higher as far as you are concerned, if you are concerned at all. And if you're not concerned, then perhaps you've got uh, a blind spot uh, with how you can be concerned. And that's a very concerning problem to have that you won't care about having. So that would be something I would really check out. Uh, <laughs> if you can't get concerned, you need to fake being concerned about that. Because I promise you, there is something there that you need, um, and you've decided it's not there. And there is a lot hiding behind the wall of the proper use of concern. Um, so yeah, you have to find these walls, these limitations that you that you don't know you have, uh, and all of that is, is done by being creative, really. Oh, just be creative, great. Well, too bad if you're crying about that. I give a lecture on how to be creative. Go do that if you don't know how to be creative. I've taken that excuse away from you. That's why that lecture was first, by the way. There's an order to these things. Can't just jump in and get the magic beans. You gotta climb the stalk first. Beans are after the vine grows. So you gotta be creative. So enhance physical perspective. Well, that can take a lot of forms. Um, I've talked about how to see more. If you're unethical, you'll see more butts. And, and, and that's a little joke there. A prank phone call from the 1980s wants its joke back. <laughs> but I've said, I've said that's how you see more with your perspective. Um, but that's different than noticing more. Yeah, that's a horse of a different color. Because you can train yourself to notice certain things. But you got to do it in advance. You got to know what's noticed. You got to know what to look for. You got to know why you're looking for it. At least at the start, when you're figuring out what the thing you're trying to notice means. Um, for example, a thing that many people learn how to notice on their own. When somebody looks very angry, you've seen. Everybody has seen how that can ripple through a room. One loud, angry person is something everybody notices. Well, that's an easy thing to notice. That person might be a threat. I might need to look out for that person. But what else do you notice about that person? You notice uh, what kind of shirt they're wearing? how wrinkled it is, how long it's been since they've shaved, uh, if their hair looks combed, if there's stains on their clothing, if they're shaking, if they have needle marks, if they have bruises, if they have burn marks, if they have tattoos. What about ink smudges on the side of their hand? What kind of muscles do they have? Do they skip leg day? Are they in shape? Do they look like they could take a punch? Do their eyes have bravery in them? What kind of clothing 
designs do they wear? Is it thrift store? Is it brand name? Are they experiencing a fall from grace? Or did their homeless shelter just run out of gruel? Two very different types of situations. The details that you notice are what will set you apart from the person who makes the wrong choice if, you, if, if you're the one that makes the right one. So all of that stuff that I listed, that was a fraction of what you can train yourself to pay attention to. Pet hair, dirt on the shoes. The words a person uses. If you've got a good enough memory, you can keep track. If you've got a really good memory and some pattern recognition and some training, you can keep track of the words they don't use. What's their education level? How many books do you think they've read? Do you know for sure? Absolutely not. Can you learn to notice things that would make you have a very good guess? Depends on how much you can notice and how much you can notice it right. How does somebody react when you give them news? How much information is contained in their face? How much information do you notice if you have a hard time looking them in the eye because you just don't look people in the eye very often? How much information do you miss by avoiding the single most accurate fo focusing tool a person has? Your ability to know where an eye is looking is such an incredibly precise thing that you are capable of. You can know when someone is looking at you from very far away. And you're sure of it. And you're right because they were looking for you. Like you can pick that shit out in a crowd. How long do you stay there? Just enough to make contact? Just enough to make the other person not feel uncomfortable, like you're staring into their soul? Because maybe that's socially unacceptable to be that intense all the time? I think it's uh, a difference thing. I think it's, uh, it's more of an intimidation to be next to somebody who is that aware all the time would feel very similar, subjectively speaking, to being next to someone who's rude because they stare. <laughs> the eye that doesn't blink is an eye that is not ignored. Uh, try it. If you wanna get promoted at your job, make extended eye contact with your boss. Keep it. If he looks away first, you're going to get promoted one day. Because you've measured his soul or her soul better than they've measured their own or that they're comfortable measuring. That's that social trick. If you want, if you want to know what's possible by learning uh, expanded awareness, learn how to look at somebody's eye and tell what they're feeling. And learn how to look at someone's eye without looking away. You will know that person better than they know themselves because every word that you use will get a reaction physically. Your words will be reacted to. And that's where the training comes in. How many ways are there to react to a word and what could they mean? How does that expand when you use a word that is uh, socially charged versus one that is not? Can you limit the number of possible interpretations a word might have so that you can tell beyond a doubt which bias they're experiencing because that phrase is specifically designed to produce an either or response or reaction that ferrets out that bias. You're checking for the bias. You're not putting it there. You're just observing where it can be found. 
So when I talk about expanded physical awareness and how to use it, um, here's the thing though. You're not gonna be able to do this if you hate yourself. And I'll tell you what will trip you up because you'll be able to make eye contact. <laughs> you'll be able to make eye contact. You might even be able to keep it, but you won't be calm. And that's gonna show in your eyes. So if you are not comfortable with yourself, doing this experiment is a very good way to find that out. Because if you stare into somebody's eyes and they become less interested in you, or they become nervous over time, what you are giving them is breaking them down in ways they don't understand. Do you make people look away how would you know if you don't look into their eyes? Do you look away when you do things that would make people look away? Do you distract yourself with your own show and miss the parts of your act that do not land well? Parts that you insist be included in every performance. <laughs> That's the question. Well, the way to find that out is simple. Learn how to look into someone's eyes and make them happier doing it. You can do that. Whatever you're giving other people is something they feel is good for them. If they get tired and need a break, whatever you're doing is too much. So that's kind of all I have about enhanced uh, physical perspective, enhanced perception. Um, I don't think it takes. What was that last line? What line? And you said that if it's too intense, then you're doing too much. Yeah, if, if people need a break from whatever you're doing, then you're doing too much. You could have hit a sweet spot that was that was yeah, more of what, a letdown. Yeah, but what makes it too much? I, I was just explaining my they story tell last you. week. They tell you after you screwed it up. If you couldn't notice it happening in real time, that's that's my answer. You have to notice it's happening before it happens. You have to know how to spot when it's happened. So that's that's the thing. First is identifying the single sound. <laughs> then identifying all the different sounds that make it up. It's the same concept, really. Yeah, but I have a slogan that I um talked about last week, Wednesday. Okay. Always leave them wanting less. Uh, take care of everything you can. Um, kind of like uh, staying after work to help the boss clean up, and to like volunteering for enough things to the point where, you know, the boss is like, "Why are you always here? Why don't you go home? You're, yeah. you're the greatest employee. You need to take care of yourself more." Um, and so when I hear you say, "If it's too much," You're doing it wrong. Well, if your goal is to be left alone and to isolate, then you're doing exactly what you're trying to do. Uh, I think the I other person is taking your cue to leave you alone. <laughs> but in the examples I gave of the boss, it isn't a negative wanting less. It's a it's still too intense for them to not have to reciprocate or mention in a positive the, what, word. Did, what word did you use a very important word they they what they feel obligated that's yeah, the part that i try to avoid i don't like putting obligation on other people they didn't ask for but that's a personal uh, disgust sensitivity that i have because that's what i grew up with so i'm very sensitive anytime that it's found Sometimes that's the right answer. If somebody's not doing their job, you want to put obligation on them and they can feel it. But if people are just living their life, you know, unless they're okay with it, putting an obligation like that on somebody is something they need to take care of now. 
It's a piece of mental garbage they previously didn't own. They need to clean it up. They need to react. You left a turd on their doorstep, but they like you, so they're trying to laugh it off. <laughs> That's a perspective I could see. I'm just trying to figure out why somebody would choose it. Uh, well, it's not that they can't. It's that, it's that that's their natural reaction. So it's not that they choose it. It's that they haven't learned how to choose. No, I mean, why would, why, would, why, would, why would the situation appear that way to you and not to me? I understand your perspective. Oh. But why, why at what point are our perspectives different? Why There's not a question that? I have yet to bridge the gap between. I don't. I but don't I understand your perspective. You, I don't see the part where you I ask you. for permission for that type of uh, imposition to be okay. Go away. Thank you. So that was the so the only part that I was missing was the part where you gave someone consent to participate in this interaction, or if you just kind of sprung it on them, and they had to deal with it. So that's where the split happens. If it's one way or the other, um, then I would say in this case, yes, in this case, no. Uh, but that where would be where the split forms. If you see that entire situation as one thing, that's where I see it as two. Talk to grandma, I'll make you see. Does that make sense? Most of it. So uh, if I distill that down, the split for me always happens with consent, informed consent. So if I create an uncomfortable situation, it's because people have given me permission to create uncomfortable situations around them. Um, and that's a thing that you explore ahead of time. But if it's, it's, it's just sort of this um, give them until they want you to go away, that's almost like a silent way of mapping a boundary and that isn't what I thought I meant. I thought. He said, always leave them wanting oh, less. Not. So they actually want less than they have is what I took away because that was what you said. Why would they want less? Because they have too much. Okay, go sit down. The intake is clogged. You, you've not used their machine the way it was designed. Your feed rate was too high. Yeah. So See, and it, my thoughts were. Down. And my thoughts are leave them wanting less, as in the biblical sense of God giving us blessings running over. Okay. Somebody asks you for $20, but you know that they could use more than that or would appreciate more than that, giving them more than that. And it's not about producing a feeling of obligation, but rather a feeling of... Uh, overwhelming positivity a discomfort in love <laughs> love is uncomfortable i made that status before i said if i love you it means i can make you uncomfortable it means no it, it, i put something about how if you're my friend or if you want my love that means that i have your permission to make you uncomfortable or something like that so that's, I think, where it's where the um, the distinction is going to be made. I think that's where we will agree is that if you're, and this is everything, by the way, not just this, this idea. This is every idea that we've ever discussed. So this is a broad range. Oh, I'm in a meeting, please. I'm in, I'm done, I'll be done in five minutes. So this is a broad ranging generalization when I say this is everything that's going somewhere needs a goal. Um, I could even say that more specifically. Everything that is going somewhere has a goal, even if it doesn't know what that goal is. Uh, because you can define goal as where you end up. So if you have smart goals, you'll want to end up in places that will make you better off, or whatever you decide that means, than you were before. If you don't know what's going on and you just react, well, you're setting all sorts of weird goals. They might not do anything, but they will do exactly what you put into motion. So if you want to be the world record pancake flipper, you know, you're putting that out there. <laughs> but if you just get really fast with a spatula because you're swatting flies, 
Well, you've got part of what it takes to be a world championship uh, pancake flipper but it's not organized in any way that's useful to you unless you have an abundance of flies. Uh, <laughs> uh, the point is, is that the goal needs to be love. And that's such a, that what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the word, overly Hollywood, like how much, how much blood can Hollywood wring from that stone before the word love starts to lose all meaning? It's already been diluted. Um, so when I talk about love now, I need to clear out some emotional baggage. Um, I'm talking about the part of you that treats other people with the same amount of dignity and respect that you would yourself and your family. That is what I mean by love. If there are conditions that you place on that type of love, fine. Those conditions should not exist for yourself. Unless you have a good reason to feel that way about yourself and you might. Not everybody does great things all the time, myself included. Uh, my wife has, has helped me learn how to speak to people better. I have a harsh tone. It's because I'm subtractive in my thought process by nature. I measure by what is not there. That can sound very challenging to people because technically it is. Uh, I just don't recognize that as a challenge that is unfair um, because to myself, it's not. What is it there? Okay, this and this and this, great. What is there? What's left? This and this and this. Great. Now I have enough to, to go on. But other people who don't view the world that way, you can say, well, what's missing? And they say, what do you mean what's missing? I have enough. Well, now the conversation isn't about what's missing. It's about if you have enough. I never said you didn't have enough. You did. You clearly did. That's why I'm here. You had enough to make this work. How are you operating without this thing I see? Because I don't see how that's possible. And I want to know the secret to your success. What do you have that is so stable that it can withstand this obviously flawed perspective that breaks down under any sort of mathematical scrutiny? Uh, that's not to say that you're a bad person because most of what we understand uh, in every human being can be broken down with a sufficient amount of mathematical scrutiny. So it's not about who has the best mathematical scrutiny. It's about who has the most useful summations of thought. And that's how you find them. But you need two pieces of information. What is there and what is not? This type of thinking doesn't believe in blank. Which makes it very good at certain things where blank gets in the way. And it makes it impossible to use when blank is counterproductive by nature for the goal. You can't run backwards away from a finish line and finish the race against people who are running forward. Now, you can keep running backwards away from the finish line until you go all the way back around the world, and that's possible. And you'll pick up a lot of tricks that have nothing to do with what you were trying to do. So it's not wasted. But it's wasted if you give up halfway and stop going because it's starting to look like that thing you were running for in the first place, because that's what happens. <laughs> you run far enough away from it and it'll start getting bigger from the other side. So if you start running from that, well, then you're just running away. So anything that you need that's over there is, is lost because you've decided away is where you won't be because there'll be dragons. Uh, you got any anything to add to this one, Tony? I think this was a pretty decent one. No, I uh, added more in the middle than usual. Well, all right, I feel like I got uh, got myself back on track. Yeah, I had a rough couple of days, man. What was going on? Uh, the shortest explanation is I got into a shadow boxing match that I couldn't win. So you got caught in a loop? I got, yeah. And it wasn't that I got caught in a loop of the same thing. It was, I got caught in a loop where all of my tricks didn't work. So it wasn't one life. thing that would fail. It was everything that failed over time. And I just couldn't perceive the way that I was attacking myself. It was an extra dimensional threat. So I know what it is. I'm lacking a dimension of thought, which makes the attacks completely invisible and imperceivable. Uh, but my, Mike Mobley helped me figure out where it was coming from. And once I could see where it was coming from, that was what I needed to 
to map a strategy out and to figure out why it was so invisible. It was a tricky one there. Um, I'm transitioning from putting my body back in charge of the emotions that happen. So I operate by conscious emotion, uh, which is better than no emotion. Um, and with conscious emotion, I can navigate the day with emotional goals that I meet. Um, and that's the overarching scaffolding that guides my, my, my emotional structure for the day. Um, now, because I have that structure to fall back on, I can still experience all the, the normal highs and lows that come along with it. That's, that's what the scaffolding is designed to create is a point of stability so that I can let myself go and feel more regular emotions as they happen. But that point of stability is still arbitrary and it's still consciously driven. And what that means is the part of my body that is supposed to be in charge of this, the competence-based hierarchy of my biology, that is the thing that I'm supposed to be trusting with these decisions. It needs to be a felt process not a conscious one because the thoughts, the thought conversion of this process is inefficient. Uh, it doesn't hit the required level of depth that can only be felt by an internal perspective, which means emotional control from an internal perspective uh, to, to skip to the chase lives in the liver. So that is the part of you that needs to be in charge of which emotions go where. Now you can direct it, you can interact with it, you can become aware of it. Uh, and through sound, music, frequency, vibration, you can help it align to certain ways of thought. But what I was struggling with was I had taken down my scaffolding and I was trying to put my body back in charge and I was failing because I didn't understand how to do what I was trying to do yet because I had never done it before. And that's what I was experiencing. And it just was like being cut off from a lot. Uh, there was a lot of futility. There was a lot of pointlessness, existential like dread, uh, fatigue. What's it all for? What's the point, et cetera. But that was because I had removed the fake copy of those motivation systems that I was using to keep running those weak systems. And I was switching over to the more robust engine that is the body and starting to learn how to trust it, not to screw that up because that's my fault. That was my wall that I put up with. I can't trust my body with my own emotions. So I need to regulate them and I'm suck at it because they get it right way more often than I do. Um, anyways, that, that's what I was going through. Um, so once I figured out that was the problem, the sources of anxiety were easily dealt with. The, uh, the things I could do to try and help that were easily thought of. But knowing where to focus was what I was struggling with. I didn't know where to look. And it, it really had me bothered because that's a very, the, the, the length of that is a very long time for me to not know where to look and not have any idea. Like that level of, that lack of intuition is unknown to me. And that's what wore me down over time is where was my intuition? Um, but my intuition was correct when it said, go find this person. And then I did, and they fixed it. <laughs> Sounds good. I will see you online and on Thursday. Thank you, Tony. You're welcome. See ya.